how does this work? So as I was telling you, in the Cortronic layer of the brain, there's this three millimeter little thin section where you have various specialized um, neural cells, pyramid cells, you have axons and dendrites and all your synapses that create this neural network that can be modeled in software for your brain. Let's do this side first. So imagine, let's just pick five inputs that we're going to put into this network of nodes. And each one of these nodes has a scalar weight that's adjustable. Um, so you essentially end up with a multiply and accumulate process at each one of the nodes that gets propagated through this network. Now these little nodes here are the, are the cells, the neurons in your brain that we're going to organize in a grid, a very large grid matrix of little circles inside these. Okay. So what we're trying to get to is model how the brain processes data. So we started with describing, for instance, we're going to use our eyes. Let X1 be your eyes, X2 be your, your nose for smell. So these are your five senses. Okay. Just modeling a human, for instance. Okay. So these are our inputs from the environment that are going feeding the neural network in our brain that then creates memory. So what we're going to try and first understand is how does memory work? Well, the way it's modeled is each one of these neural cells is put into a very, very large matrix in two dimensions, and they can all be interconnected as shown here. So pretty much any one of these cells, so this cell could actually connect over here, right? but the way we've set it up is a regular connection so that this cell and this cell feed to that one. You get these weights and accumulations based on the input data. And uh, essentially what you have in each one of these has weights as well. And there's a multiply and accumulate at every junction. So what that does is stores a little number relative to that node that models the accumulation of input potential in your neurons that causes the threshold activation for information to jump from one neural cell to the next one through the dendrites, across the synapses like that. So these represent the threshold firing activation of the cell, these weights. And like I said, they're initially chosen and then they're adjusted based on the inputs. So essentially as these weights change, you end up with different um, weighting factors to determine whether this neural pathway is going to fire, just like the nerve cells in your cortronic network. So let's do an example. Yeah. So suppose we see a stop sign for the very first time. It's at a fixed distance, fixed light level, and our eyes see it, and we create an association of that object in the external environment with this memory capacity we have that's represented by this bi-directional associative matrix of neural cells. So I see the stop sign, and perhaps I just randomly pick. So these neurons, maybe they get activated through this process on this side. And they get interconnected so that every time you see a stop sign, these particular cells light up because they're interconnected through this weighting matrix, okay? So imagine there's a weight that gets so small that the signal can't propagate through here, so it stops there. So essentially, you can see that node might get lit up, but this one won't, and that's what's represented by the, what we call these dot patterns, we call that a token. And these tokens get trained, let's stick with the, the let's stick with the stop sign, for instance. This token only represents the stop sign at this distance, a fixed distance when we first saw it at this light level at, and at this angle. So there's all these parameters to associate an external object with this memory base. So now imagine you see the stop sign, different light level, different angle, different distance. And you see this multiple times over and over. Think of this as the training process of you being exposed to this object and it refines the connectivity of the neural dot in your bidirectional associated memory. So now I see the stop sign at this angle, or I see it up close or far away in different light levels. I still call that a stop sign, okay? But that means these tokens that are in this memory network get modified based on your perception of that object in, in the 3D environment, the hologram, okay? Your, your neural network pattern is gonna be different than mine because of how we experience that, right? Mm -hmm. This is true for everyone. Now, so you can go to any extreme with this, and it turns out this matrix is so large, it can, it can store so much memory in there. It's like thousands of HD 1080i movies <laughs> simultaneously in here. 
And this is why people say, from a scientific standpoint, we don't use very much of our brain. Very small amount of this neural network actually ever gets fully interconnected. Okay, so let's, let's think about another example of how you could use this. So suppose I take all this input data through my five senses and I keep feeding and feeding and feeding and all these life events and circumstances into this network. And I train this one for one particular individual. And then I go expose something at the input. Maybe it's a stop sign, whatever. Well, when that shows up in this network, what I'm going to get out of a neural network is really two pieces of fantastic data. The first one is pattern recognition. So if I put a pattern in here, this thing through the weights will spit out what that is from your memory. Well, that's a stop sign. You know what I'm so it's really fantastic for pattern managing. And the military uses for recognizing tanks and other opposing force equipment from various angles and distances so that they could train their systems to be able to recognize this with artificial intelligence. Okay, well, there's lots of other and The other uh, application of this is prediction. Suppose this isn't real data. Okay, or you train the whole network with all scads of massive training data, whatever field you're trying to train to the network. And then you put in some unknown input random pattern here, and you're trying to determine, is this a possible scenario that could happen? Well, you put that in here, and then the network will tell you the predictive output, whether that propagates through. Well, this is how Google and all the search engines work to affiliate words with those patterns that are stored in its bi-directional associative memory, and that's how it pulls it up so fast for you, okay? So I just wanted to give an example of how bi-directional associative memory and neural networks work, because these are the kind of the forefront of the software that's being used in the artificial intelligence space. And I spent a lot of time, as a matter of fact, Quartronic Networks was a specialty of mine in graduate school where I studied under Robert Heck Nielsen, who was the head of HNC Software, where they actually invented the algorithm that Google ended up with, the search algorithm. And this is what it was based on. And that's about all I have to say about neural networks. But I actually find them so fascinating. I've coded them up in software as part of my coursework and spent three um, full semesters in this space. And I found it absolutely fascinating that we truly now know and can model in software how the human brain works. And that includes storing sequences of tokens that represent actions that can be stitched together that represent motions as you train the human body. So when you understand how the tokens work and how they bi-directionally associate an object out there within here and back and forth and how that brings up contextual memory and how all this works uh, it's, it's really quite fascinating so that's all i have to say about neural networks